let's take a look now at satellite images of the Gulf Stream, which reveals some of the complexity of its features. Here's one taken in April of 2005, and the cooler temperatures here are depicted in the blues and purples, the warmer temperatures in these kinds of whites and pinks, and here you see the Gulf Stream traveling up across, up northwards, northeastwards along the east coast of the United States. Here's Long Island, New York, Chesapeake Bay. And you can see the cold water of the Labrador Current where the two of them meet. And you can see that the Gulf Stream meanders back and forth in this region, much like a river might meander. If you, if you look at riverbeds over the years, you see how they meander back and forth. This meandering of the Gulf Stream as it moves through the ocean and moves through the North Atlantic Ocean gives rise to some features that we'll talk about in a few moments. But I want you to take special note of this sort of thumb of water or finger of water here, this cold water moving in here, surrounded by warmer water, this warmer, this warmer water here, excuse me, this warmer water surrounding this cooler water here. So again, the pinks uh, and colors are in colder. So here we have warm water surrounding cold water. Here we have warm water surrounding this sort of cooler thumb. And opposite kind of thing where we have regions of, and they don't show up very well in this particular image, but warm, but cooler water surrounding warmer water. So we have these kinds of features. But take just a special note of this section right here. And if we look at Chlorophyll concentrations, so now we're looking at the plant life, same image, different kinds of wavelengths of light used to determine these. What you see is a this that thumb here of colder water penetrating into the deeper water. Here you see that feature right here, and we'll see that in more details in just a few minutes. You see some of the complexity, some of the swirling of water also giving rise to higher concentrations of chlorophyll. Here's this one right here. So here's warmer water surrounding colder water. Here's higher concentrations of plankton, lower concentrations of plankton. Here's the same kind of thing, warmer water surrounding colder water, higher concentrations of plankton, as well as just the high concentrations of phytoplankton that we see this time of year because it's spring. So this is part of the spring bloom that we see along the east coast here. But we also see features, increases in chlorophyll associated with some of these physical features, these structures that we're talking about right here. Let's take a look at it in a little bit closer detail, a little bit close up of an image. And here you get to see warmer water, excuse me, yes, warmer water surrounding colder water here. We see colder water being surrounded by warmer water, okay? Uh, here we have an example of colder water, this purple wrapping around warmer water. So there's some regions where we have cold water surrounded by warm water, and there's some regions where we have warm water surrounded by cold water. We want to keep those in mind in a few minutes. But let's look what happens when we overlay the chlorophyll map. So as that comes in slowly, you can still see some of the sea, te sea surface temperature features and you get a better idea of how the physical structure of the world ocean, in this case, the complexity of the Gulf Stream, influences the biology. And so where the cold and warm water meet, where those cold and warm water masses meet, they form a kind of boundary, a kind of front. And it's at those fronts we get conditions that are ideal for blooms of phytoplankton. Okay, well let's move on a little bit with this because those features that we just talked about, those sort of the penetration of colder water into warmer water and vice versa, give rise to something called eddies, or actually mesoscale eddies. And they're mesoscale because they're on a middle scale. They're not very small. They're not extremely large. They're sort of in the middle. And they range anywhere from, say, 10 to 30 to 50 to 100. It's you know, not given a real exact definition when something's mesoscale or small scale. But in general, in that sort of miles of diameter, and these eddies are these large-scale or mesoscale type of circulation patterns 
When they trap warm water, so cold water surrounding warm water, we call that a warm core ring. And rings that form on the seaward side of the Gulf Stream, they trap cold water in and among warm water, we call those cold core rings. And as it says here, we're talking about sizes from 60 to 180 miles. They may extend to depths of 1,000 meters, 3,300 feet or so. And some of these eddies that are shed off the, the Gulf Stream, and you think of them like whirlpools, although they're not really whirlpools because they're such large in size, but these independently circulating motions of water, eddies of water that shed off the Gulf Stream, they may last up to years, several years or so. So here we have by the Gulf Stream and also the Kuroshio Current as well, another western boundary current, these sort of tornado-like or maybe even hurricane-like structures, just talking in terms of an independently rotating system that's shed off the Gulf Stream and moves across the North Atlantic Ocean, an independent physical structure. And that has important implications, not only for ocean physics, because these things carry heat with them and other types of materials, but also for ocean biology. And as we study these rings more, we learn that certain kinds of organisms follow these rings and certain kinds of organisms are attracted to these rings and they have sort of a life of their own. Again, physical structure of the ocean creating habitat for organisms, a theme that I keep coming back to and a theme that's of major importance in understanding how the world ocean works as a system. If we look at these, this picture once again, we can mark some of the rings. And I apologize here because these three are actually cold core rings. So here we have warmer water surrounding colder water. So here we have three cold core rings. Ignore this for the moment. On the opposite side, we actually have cold water. And this is the beginning on the landward side of the Gulf Stream, this is the beginning of what might be a cold core ring because here we have warmer water trying to surround colder water. And again, it's not, these aren't complete rings. These aren't the best examples of cold core rings, but these are pretty good examples of warm core rings. And what we learn from this is that eventually, because, because of the meanders of the Gulf Stream, because you get colder water trapped by warmer water or vice versa, these things may shoot off into the North Atlantic Ocean carrying heat with them, carrying different salinity water, carrying different kinds of nutrients, and really they have their own associated biology with them. So they're extremely important. Here's another view of it. In fact, it's the same image, just different color profile. And you will recall, to measure sea surface temperatures, we're looking at different wavelengths of light, in particular different wavelengths of long wave radiation coming off of the ocean. We assign a specific color to each one of those wavelengths or bands of wavelengths of long wave radiation coming off of the ocean. And we get an image like this. And obviously the reds are the warmest, the blues and greens are colder. And here again you see the cold core ring, the making of a cold core ring here, the, the more beginning of one here, one here, one here, and so actually this looks more like a warm core ring to me, although it's hard to tell from the, because this part of the image isn't present, but here you can see the great complexity of structure in the world ocean. And when you go back to that satellite image of chlorophyll, you can see that phytoplankton are reacting to changes in the physical structure of the ocean. So where we have phytoplankton reacting to changes in the physics, we're going to have food webs that are going to be fueled by or not fueled by, depending on what the phytoplankton are doing. And so again, ocean physics and biology interacting. Here's an image from the book, again, an idealized diagram of the formation of these rings. So when you have a meander that traps cold water, we get a cold core ring. When you have a meander that traps warm water, we get a warm core ring. These cold core rings, because of their circulation pattern, this is a cyclonic circulation, remember, it actually bends the thermocline upwards and as a result brings cold nutrient-rich water towards the surface in these cold core rings.